welcome everyone to the next set. Let me figure out uh, how to get my slides up here. Is it a touch screen? I don't know where the mouse is. I know, right? There you go. Yeah. And then, oh. And then, do you have the clicker? This is, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's my job to introduce to you two different disorders. Some of you who might be affected by them, and I saw some hands uh, come up, particularly for transverse myelitis, you need no real introduction to the disorder because unfortunately you've had it. My job isn't to make you clinicians to recognize it, but I hope to give you a familiarity today with where we stand with understanding these disorders and what I think the promise is for the future from what we understand of some but many of what we don't understand about others. Again, I'll apologize for the projection, but remind you that you should have printouts of all the slides here so you don't have to be reminded that you have a visual distortion in the middle of your images if you're curious in taking notes or pictures. So what do we mean when we say transverse myelitis or make a diagnosis of transverse myelitis? And what we're talking about is an acute or subacute spinal cord dysfunction. And that could include a motor problem, difficulty moving multiple or one limb, a sensory problem, difficulty feeling something, or even a problem with bowel or bladder. And you don't have to have all three, but you may have to have at least one of those symptoms. And the diagnostic criteria as physicians and neurologists include that there be bilateral problems, so it can't just be one little part of the spinal cord. There has to be a clearly defined level of dysfunction, so there has to be not a diffuse or uncertain localization. And what we mean by acute or subacute is that the symptom onset has to run its course by as short as four hours or as long as 21 days. We need proof, and that proof comes from either imaging or spinal fluid analysis. And we have to figure out that there's no other evidence of another cause of spinal cord injury, uh, such as trauma, because myelitis refers to some level of inflammation. What the problem is with a diagnosis of transverse myelitis is it's a symptomatic diagnosis and there can be many different causes of transverse myelitis. It can be the result of an infection, a direct infection that you've heard of with suspicion of acute flaccid myelitis being an active infection rather than just purely inflammation of the spinal cord. It can be post-infectious or post-vaccination, that is, especially in children more often than adults, you can have a vaccine and a rare but unfortunate post-vaccination inflammation. It can be an infection that triggers an abnormal immune response where there is confusion, as mentioned before, between the immune response targeting the foreign invader, let's say a virus, and then getting confused that part of the body looks like part of this virus, particularly part of the nervous system. There could be a systemic autoimmune disorder in which transverse myelitis is a portion of uh, that disorder, or a demyelinating disorder where we think that the main focus of the immune response is against the white matter, the insulation part of the nervous system, particularly the most common being multiple sclerosis, which can present with acute transverse myelitis. There is what we thought was a variant of multiple sclerosis, and now we appreciate it as something totally distinct, neuromyelitis optica, that predominantly affects the spinal cord and the optic nerves. And then, unfortunately, a significant fraction of transverse myelitis is idiopathic, our fancy word for unknown, okay? The issue with this 
uncertain cause is that identifying a cause is critical because it assists us as physicians in understanding what the prognosis is for that isolated event of transverse myelitis, what to do to help make patients as good as possible in terms of their recovery, and what's the chance that this might happen again, both in the spinal cord or somewhere else in the nervous system. So as I mentioned, since the causes are heterogeneous, there's many different entities that we as clinicians have to think about when someone has an episode of transverse myelitis. Is there an active infection going on? Is there a systemic autoimmune process? Is there a demyelinating disease? Is this a remote effect of cancer? Or is this something to do with an infection that has to actively be treated? Or are we dealing with a post-infectious process or post-vaccination process in which the issue is how to get you better now because the likelihood that this will ever happen again is pr practically zero. So with that said, this gives you an idea. This is just a list on the left right here of all the potential infections you might have to think about if you're thinking that this is infectious. So that's even without looking at the rest of the six other entities I put on that single slide. So there's a lot to be done to figure out what the cause is and particularly what the best medication is, because unfortunately, many of these infections are not directly treatable. Many of them are viruses, and in most viral infections, except for herpes virus infections, we just do supportive care. We're not having the armamentarium to directly treat the infectious agent. So I want to give you a general idea of the rarity of your disorder, we talk about 1.3 to 8 patients per million population as being affected by transverse myelitis. That's one idea of how rare it is. Another idea of how rare it is is that when you ask your clinician what you have and they go, I've never heard of it, that gives you an idea of what is rare disorder. There are two peaks of transverse myelitis. There's a young peak at each 10 to 19 years old and another from 30 to 39 years old. But unfortunately, nothing that gives us big clues in terms of a sex bias, males versus females, a geographic bias in terms of how patients are affected across the world or within regions, and nothing yet as a clue of a genetic bias. And that is possibly because, as I mentioned before, that whole list is broad, and it's quite broad in terms of multiple causes. And so until you start to get hints at what is a certain cause, X versus Y, it's hard to see some of those biases come through because there's a lot of noise going on in the system. The prognosis also is highly variable. And that's because adults and children can have different levels of recovery, the dependency on the etiology, but in general, most recovery, if it's going to happen from transverse myelitis, happens in the first three months, but can extend as far as one year after the onset. And in terms of prognosis, there's nothing that we can see that where you're affected in terms of the world makes a difference and in terms of what your genetics are in terms of your recovery. So there's nothing that we can do right now in order to give patients and families, unfortunately, a most discreet answer about, gee, what's the chance that I'm going to get better, is that we have to wait and see as much as, unfortunately, you have to wait and see. So with all that, what are we going to do when you have transverse myelitis? And this is typically what we do. This is the formula for most patients, and that is no one should be affected by transverse myelitis without receiving the potential benefit of steroids. What do steroids really do, as far as we can tell by looking at compendium of data, is that it makes people get better faster. We don't have very strong data that steroids necessarily change outcome, but again, that mixture of patients may make interpretation confusing. We generally give large doses, and we generally give it over multiple days. Whether we should slowly withdraw the steroids or abruptly withdraw it, again, remains uncertain. Slow withdrawal, particularly for an ongoing or smoldering immune process, could facilitate further recovery by cutting down any ongoing inflammation that might be causing damage. 
or it can be important as a bridging therapy because if you need chronic immune suppression, taking sort of the safety net out from affecting the immune system before the next drug takes effect can be important. Often when steroids don't work, a very common approach is to go to washing out the blood, essentially hooking you up to a grand old washing machine called a plasma exchange unit, taking out your blood, giving you your cells back, taking the bad humors out, and hopefully giving you nice neutral humors back. And this can be concurrent or following prednisone or other steroids. And generally, it's given over multiple days so we can make sure that the full extent of your blood is exchanged out so that various bad immune factors taken away and neutral ones given back. In terms of neuromyelitis spectrum disorder, a specific cause of transverse myelitis, we have evidence that doing this plasma exchange gives faster improvement and potentially improved outcomes but this does not necessarily apply to all causes of transverse myelitis. If we look at all causes of transverse myelitis, there are studies that show that plasma exchange in general doesn't have any effect, but something like cyclophosphamide does, a very acute and aggressive way of knocking down the immune system. So sometimes with isolated cases of transverse myelitis, an unknown cause, going to even bigger guns of trying to knock down the cells in the immune system rather rapidly can have improved uh, outcomes, including disability, which is rated by that EDSS scale. Now, with all that said, I was also going to and asked to touch on a specific cause of transverse myelitis, which is neuromyelitis optica. This is a demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system that has in its initial description, two entities that have to happen, acute loss of vision, optic neuritis, and acute spinal cord inflammation, or transverse myelitis. And below that, you can see the specific causes or specific criteria that we need to make this diagnosis. In particular, we needed radiographic diagnosis to show that the spinal cord inflammation was long, we needed to make sure it wasn't multiple sclerosis, that the MRI didn't look like it, and that you eventually had what really tipped the tables in understanding this disorder, a specific immune response against the water channel on astrocytes, a non-myelin-producing immune glial cell or support cell in the brain, and that was aquaporin-4. And this graph over here shows us that with all our sophistication over the years, Still, with patients that meet the clinical definition of neuromyelitis optica, only about three-quarters of them at our best assays can be shown to have this water channel present. And Dr. Schreiner and I have taken care of multiple children who initially present with all the features to make this diagnosis, but never have this antibody until maybe three or four years afterwards that you get your final proof that your guess was right. What's important about this also is that despite all this criteria that we developed clinically over roughly the past 100 years is wrong. What we figured out is that once we had this marker, this aquaporin-4 antibody that the body is specifically targeting, we were able to show that this antibody was pathogenic. It was the cause of the disease but more importantly, once we looked at patients who had this antibody, and it is very specific for this disorder, we figured out that they had much more than just transverse myelitis and optic neuritis, and many would present with isolated syndromes. Some that would have transverse myelitis would never have optic neuritis and would never have any other neurologic problem. Some might just have protracted nausea and vomiting. Some might have confusion that you heard about with uh, ADEM. And so what it, was, what it did was broaden our appreciation for what truly was the cause of this disease and how broad the umbrella was to find out who these patients were early and identify ones that would have very strong likelihood for having recurrent attacks. We also realized that the patients who didn't have this antibody still could meet diagnostic criteria and that we had to be circumspect in eliminating those patients who might truly have this disorder 
by just doing a simple blood test too quickly and dismissing it. The treatments of acute neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder are the same as what I told you about for plasma exchange. The major difference is, is that by making this diagnosis, we appreciate that a large fraction of patients are going to have future attacks and that these attacks might have as high a chance as 60% within the next year. And so getting them on specific therapies is important. And more importantly, other than what those specific therapies are, it helped us to understand that just treating them like, let's say, multiple sclerosis was a bad idea. There are three major therapies that are great for multiple sclerosis that make this condition worse. And so as we think about transverse myelitis in our acute care, who's going to recur, we also have to consider how many of those patients that we're treating acutely with what we think is beneficial, we might be doing the wrong thing. And until we differentiate those groups by more defined causes, we sometimes could be doing more harm than good. This gives you an idea. Unfortunately, it always projects bad, but I apologize for that that with neuromyelitis optica, we're developing many new therapies based on our understanding of the disorder. We have many therapies designed to target the cells that are producing inflammation in this disorder, that we have an appreciation for complement and antibodies activating a specific arm of the immune system, and this may be important for other entities in transverse myelitis, and it's never been tried before. We have an idea that the aquaporin-4 antibody is very important, and we can specifically inhibit that antibody potentially as a mode of therapy. So understanding the direct cause of transverse myelitis in individual cases can lead to very specific non-immune suppressive therapies. And we understand that cells, and you saw the whole list of cells from Dr. Schreiner, some of them are very nonspecific and just leak out enzymes to destroy target cells. And we have new armamentarium of agents that can affect these granulocytes that might be leaking their contents and hurting other cells. Finally, I want to end with that the future in thinking about transverse myelitis and even those that we have a better foothold in, neuromyelitis spectrum disorder, begins with research. We need research to clarify the diagnoses of transverse myelitis. We need research to clarify the pathogenesis. What are the exact immune mechanisms driving injury so that we can understand how best to intervene and how best to develop therapies to stop the risk of recurrence. And we need research to understand what is the best to identify those patients at risk for recurrence and develop targeted therapies to prevent future disease. And so I'll leave it there and let the panel assemble so that we can answer some of your questions. So thanks. Thank you.